everybody welcome to another episode of elevated culture brought to you by the clinic i as always am your host matthew stafford and with me uh tonight a a very different person uh no less great um but ryan cook is not here in his place we found a man worthy to fill his shoes uh we have patrick limonate patrick how you doing i'm doing well matthew thank you quite an intro uh, that's the best i could do off the top of my head but it came from the heart i'll tell you that. i can't fill a lot of people's shoes but <laughs> yeah. physically yeah well <laughs> it, it was metaphorically and and ryan has some large shoes to fill that's true. i feel that's like true. um so uh i appreciate you being here i appreciate you stepping in and for those who are listening right now who don't know you uh do you mind giving us a little bit of background about who you are where you came from what you do and you know why you're able to fill these shoes and, yeah. and be here tonight i would love to yeah so thanks for having me on as uh, the host, co-host, I should say here. Uh, So yeah, I'm the head of marketing here at uh, the clinic and I just joined the team uh, about five months ago. I just moved out to Denver from New York City. Uh, I had spent 20 years of my career all in marketing. Uh, Started in the agency world and then got into um, on the client side with uh, alcohol. Uh, I've been in beer for the last uh, 13 years. And uh, I worked for Heineken for 10 years, did some global roles for them, um, but then came back and worked domestically uh, in the States here, uh, both on uh, brand and trade marketing. So a nice little mix between uh, consumer and and retail. And then uh, joined the craft beer movement for a couple of years there. I wanted to get into a a more of a small business climate. And uh, I worked with a microbrewery in New York City called the Bronx Brewery, a great little brewery up there in the South Bronx doing good things. So came in there uh, to their shop and was the first marketer that they ever hired. So got to build the brand from scratch and you know, so much fun just kind of being part of that team. Um, but yeah, after a couple of years there, kind of felt uh, it was time for the next thing. Uh, always loved coming out to Denver to, to visit, had some friends out here, obviously loved to come out here and snowboard. Um, heard about four or five years ago that uh, you know, as cannabis was starting to become more of a thing, uh, both medically and rec- recreational, that some of the cannabis uh, companies were looking to hire from the alcohol industry. So uh, you know, it was something that I had my eye on. Um, but yeah, when I came out here, it wasn't like uh, cannabis or bust. Uh, I was looking you know, for opportunities, and obviously cannabis being one that I was interested in. Talked to a few companies, um, and obviously when I you know, started having the conversations with the clinic here, I loved uh, everything about it. I love the, the people. I love the vision. Um, I love the, the high-end boutique stores that we have here. The products that uh, we're selling um, are, are fantastic. So for me, it was a heck of an opportunity to join a great team and to, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, drive things into the future. And uh, couldn't be happier about uh, where we're headed and uh, being here right now with, uh, with you and Peter. Well, you've been absolutely crushing it since you've been here. I, I can say that personally, just from my own perspective and from hearing it from others and, and just seeing what you're doing. So we are, we're very grateful to have you on. And um, I think that background, I think it's something we're going to get into in this yeah. conversation um, from alcohol and, and from craft brewing and such. I, I think it's a very interesting angle because a lot of people talk about it when they talk about prohibition, uh, prohibition with alcohol, prohibition with cannabis, and you start seeing some similarities. Um, but it leads into a lot of other other things too. It leads into marketing. It leads into brand trust. It, there's a there's a lot that goes on there. Um, so it'll be very interesting this conversation to have you on. Very happy to have you. Yeah, no, it's gonna be fun. Um, and then and then uh, Patrick and I have a, a very special guest here tonight. Um, so for the second episode of 2019, we have Mr. Peter Bartsum from 1906. Peter, how are you doing? Doing great pleasure to be here tonight thank you well thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule and uh and being here um peter for those who don't know and they'd be crazy not to (laughs) know 1906 uh would you would you kind of give a a brief background on uh on your company and uh, and on the products that you produce yeah absolutely so first the where does 1906 come from which is uh one of the first questions we we often get asked it's not related to the san francisco earthquake um 1906 was the year that the Wiley Act was passed, which effectively started the era of prohibition of cannabis. And so we are on a mission, a mission to do two things, to uh, bring cannabis back to its pre-prohibition status when it was acceptable, when it was legal and widely available as medicine, 
And then the second thing is to highlight the failed century of prohibition and particularly its impact on uh, communities of color and inner city communities that the last hundred plus years of marijuana criminalization uh, have had on, on these communities. Um, and so uh, we started the company uh, back in early 2015, launched the brand in 2017, early 2017, with a, a clear focus, and that is on high-functioning adults, people like you and I, for whom alcohol and pharmaceuticals could be replaced uh, by cannabis. Um, and what we what we found is that there's a, a big market, we think, of uh, consumers, either current consumers or potential consumers who uh, potentially could benefit from using cannabis, um, but they require more than what the current market offers them, and, uh, uh, and particularly kind of three areas of, of focus. One is great taste, that many of the edibles products out there have a strong hashy flavor, poor quality ingredients. Is frankly things that many of us who are health conscious would never even put in our body if it wasn't infused with cannabis. Um, secondly is the fact that people want to feel a particular way. It's not about getting blasted. It's not about getting totally fucked up. It's not about seeing purple dragons. Uh, it's about my kind of high is a particular kind of high that I want, just like your kind of high is a particular kind of high that you want. Or we're looking for relief from pain or help sleeping. So. We're very much, uh, this high-functioning adult group that we're talking about is very much purpose-driven, um, that they want to feel a particular way and they don't want to play Russian roulette with any psychoactive substance. And then the third issue is the long delay between when you ingest and when you start to feel the effects. So one of, the, one of our sort of internal taglines um, is impatience is a, is a virtue. Um, and so we have the fastest acting edible on the market. And... What we found is that though, if you can do those three things right, you can give people something that tastes great, you can give people that something that gives them a consistent effect, and that you don't have to wait uh, for it to happen, that you can actually open up a whole new market of people who are willing to try and, and use cannabis. And that's what we created 1906 for. That's a it's a it's an amazing story. Amazing the way that you connect it to 1906. Before I dig into those those three points that you kind of just spoke to, um, when you started it, did you already know the history of uh, that act, the 19 in 1906, or did you? Is it something that you looked into um, after the fact? No, it, it was it was after the fact. Uh, I mean, before we launched, obviously, but after the fact, as we were thinking about. Naming, and as you would probably know, Patrick, you know, coming out of marketing, naming is really, really hard. I'm happy to hear you say that. So, <laughs> so many people think it's such an easy thing. Oh, I would love to name a beer or a strain of weed. I'm like, well, sit down and help me out one time. There are you know? so many <laughs> bad names out there, yeah. which, is, which is why I asked you, because whether you knew before or not, the, the fact that it's tied to something like that and of historical value and reference, um, I think makes the brand stronger and you're already giving it that solid foundation because I won't name any names, but there are a lot of bad names out yeah. there. Um, not, not just in cannabis, just everywhere. Oh yeah. And so it, it, we worked on the name for probably at least six months. Oh wow. Um, you have to go through a lot of bad stuff to get to something <laughs> you like. And, um, we wanted a name that was memorable. We wanted a name that denoted a mission. Um, it shouldn't have the word green. It shouldn't have the word Kana or anything else like that in it. Um, and the nice thing is also cognitively, people remember numbers a lot more than they remember uh, names as well. So uh, there is a benefit to having a number uh, to having a number as well in terms of how, how it sticks and it gives purpose to what it is that we're trying to do. That's really cool. That's good stuff. Yeah, it sounds like you guys did your research on that one. That's the cognitive uh, sort of sensory and, and and retaining numbers over uh, letters and words. That's pretty. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that at stuff. all. Yeah, it makes sense. So it now it that does I think make about sense. It. Now I'm thinking about like pin numbers, social security, yeah, area, bank area accounts, codes, and, phone numbers. Yeah, phone numbers. Yeah, yeah. That is something that we all will do. Yeah. Just blue minds right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we're, we're going to keep blowing minds as we as we continue down this rabbit hole here. Um, so you were just talking about um, three things that the company was founded on, is known for, and, you know, uh, follows. I think um, all three of them, you know, caught my mind. The third one, uh, obviously, you know, the way that you're able to have it so that people can ingest it um, and then feel it without that that waiting and waiting and waiting because I can tell you you know personally I've taken things over the over the years edibles and I'll wait and wait and wait and w- once I feel it start coming on then it's the question of when has it fully peaked and is it fully come on you know um, and people say you know it, I think in Colorado here it's wait two hours you know take this and then you start understanding your dosage you know um, and I'm a lightweight I will I will uh, definitely say that when it when it comes to edibles um, so I fully appreciate the waiting and understanding of it um, but I've I've taken 1906 before um, most recently over the weekend and uh, you know in preparation of this podcast even more yeah, trying we- a few things we talked on friday it was great because both matthew and i struggle with sleeping so we both yeah. said let's over the weekend try uh try midnight we're going to give you a live in-person product review here oh so. great Love yeah it. and and i've been taking a couple of other products too um and and with ratios of, of cbd and thc as well um but I, but i can say that i did feel the effects much much quicker um and once i started feeling them it was that onset was a nice slope and it wasn't over the course of an hour and a half you know waiting for that onset once i started feeling it it was a nice gradual and exactly the way the dosage uh, i took i expected to feel uh, i felt that and, and probably a little better because i know that you guys infuse it uh, with other herbs and things like that which we'll get to but when you're talking about that science and how you're able to get there as the most fast acting edible um how long is it, did it take you guys to get there is that something that you launched with yeah it was something that we launched with it was something that we knew from the beginning when we started the company back in january 2015 because i remember my first real edibles experience coming here to Colorado in January 2015 trying you know a bunch of different products and being like where is the off button <laughs> right uh, Pur- purple dragon time yeah mm-hmm. and and and, I, and it was it was an experience you know something that was labeled as 10 milligrams and I know sort of my, my dosage and for sure it was not and I felt nothing for for two hours and then all of a sudden it hit me like a ton Boom. of bricks and totally undesirable experience. I just want, you know, I didn't want to be high for that long. I didn't want to be that high. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't dosed appropriately. And, and you really just want it to end. And uh, I was like, nobody should have to go through this experience. And if there's one thing that's true about the industry is that almost everybody or you, you have one person removed, you know somebody who's had a negative experience uh, because they consume too much unintentionally usually. In a really bad cannabis high is, I think, way worse than drinking too much alcohol. Absolutely. I'm so happy to hear you say that. I mean, how many times in our lives have we heard friends or family be like, I'm never going to drink again? You know, after a bad night of drinking, you know, you get sick, you get it out of your system. A couple of days later, you know, I'm going to have another drink, you know, but with cannabis, it brings out a whole other level of scary. You and know? it will steer people away yeah. forever from edibles. So like yeah. forever. And and then those stories will also then affect the general public. Yeah. When you start seeing it in news outlets and media and things like that, it'll then make people already have this bad stigma against it when they've they've never tried it, understood it yeah. or looked into it. So it's very, very much understanding the effects and also being responsible and, and, and waiting that time. But being able to speed that up that's amazing that you you wanted to start with something like that um do you mind if i ask how you got there yeah uh we uh i hired a science team Uh, i hired a chief scientist and a number of other people that were working on different technologies uh that accelerate bioavailability um uh, they've had uh, years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry and one of the things that pharmaceutical scientists do well is figure out the timing of dosage, right? We have extended release, we have fast acting. So it's a known science there about how to take a certain compound, a molecule, and how to affect its onset time, right? Um, uh, but it took, us, uh, it took us a year and a half of R&D work to try and, and get that right. Um, we had two different technologies that we were developing, and then we infected a 60-person 
double-blind clinical study here in in Denver and Boulder with a age group of 30 to 45 and with an age group of 65 and above so that we had uh, sufficient sample size and uh, in different biochemistries different metabolisms yep and so we had 60 people we subjected them to four different types of edibles one was an active placebo and three different formulations to be able to assess both intra-person variability and interpersonal uh, variability as well and that's what got us down to okay here's the right way to do it we know we can we can claim because 95 percent of the uh, the subjects in the clinical study started to feel effect in uh, between 18 to 20 minutes so we, we did some serious science in order to be able to say hey this is fast acting and this is works now I want to do better. I think I'd like to get it down to, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes better than than 20 minutes. And we're actually doing some more research on that so that we can accelerate the bioavailability. It's it's not just a consumer convenience. It's also safer. Hmm. And, you know, if you think about the Maureen Dowd effect uh, for your listeners who uh, are familiar with the New York Times journalist who came to Colorado, ate a whole bunch of edibles and then talked about how horrible experience was. Um, you know, that's normal yeah. uh, uh, that, that people do that because it's, it's hard to dose and hard to figure it out if you don't know what's going on there. So it's a much safer way for people to consume something uh, than to be hit on the head like an hour or two later. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. And who plans their life? And like, who plans their life six hours ahead of time? <laughs> Not many people. Yeah. Those, those who do that don't don't have. They have a lot of time on their hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the people we're going after. Yeah. We're going after the the, the busy, high functioning adults. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah. where this industry is going. You know, it came from from medical, and you know, I. I think it always has that place and I love that foundation and where it's come from and how it helps people. But obviously we've seen over the years in Colorado uh, being the first to go live with it with recreational. um, It's something that everyone has wanted as well. So people who also used it for for medical purposes also had wanted to use it recreationally. Um, And I think as these new growth markets and these new consumer markets come on, especially when it comes to something like edibles where you do have to wait there is that bioavailability there are those different like i said everyone's biochemistry is different um you know metabolisms are different it depends on if you've eaten or you haven't eaten these sort of things it can affect everyone completely differently um when you have something that's consistent and you have something that you don't have to wait that many hours you know two hours for it to affect you uh, I think is is a major play and a major change in the industry because as this grows that's what people want and I think that's what the industry needs they need something that's reliable like that um, and that people don't have to wait a long time to to think about because when I was talking a few minutes ago about you know I'll take something and then wait an hour and then it's well is it now peaking is it not peaking that sort of thing you know it do i do i take a little more or have i taken too much did i take just enough you know that sort of thing it's a guessing game and when it's two three hours later uh that's not a guessing game i like to play yeah (laughs) you know um so it's nice to have uh have brands that started with this um and and with this idea in mind to be able to do it um because a lot of them i think especially initially wanted to just say here's this many milligrams, as many as I can go, doesn't really matter. Um, obviously, on the recreational side, you have to do it in 10 milligram dosages, single use dosages. Um, but on the medical side, there is a, is a lot more. But for for years, there were people who were kind of balancing between the two. I know people who took deca doses without knowing and had horrible experiences. You know, and it's. Uh, why would you ever do that? And they they weren't educated. And that's one of the big things, I think, in this industry that uh, a lot of people maybe don't put as much credit in. But education, I think, is is very key. And it, and it relies on bud tenders, you know, all the way from the people who manufacture the product and the companies that sell it. But it goes, it's very specifically on the bud tenders um, being educated and being able to educate uh, the patients and the customers. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, in particular, you know, one of the things that we're launching uh, later this summer are beverages. 
And we've grown up in this society knowing how to consume alcohol most of the time. Or we figured out, uh, you know, during college after a lot of bad nights or whatever, right? You figure out, okay. Or good. Or good nights. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You take the good with the bad. And and you learn from when you're young that one shot equals one glass of wine equals one cocktail, right? And you learn, okay. Wait, sorry. That's that's a thing? (laughs) (laughs) You just taught me me something there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I had, I had a chat. Yeah, and and so we're educated on how to consume alcohol. Yep. Right. Um, we need that same education. It's going to be particularly acute when it comes to uh, cannabis beverages here. I agree. Yeah, I was just listening to both of you guys talk about that. It just reminded me of so many sort of like, let's call them drinking lessons that we you know you learn it, but you don't learn them from a book. You know, you you learn them from like you know peer groups. You learn them from your older brother. Or maybe even your parents. You know, I remember learning early on about uh, you know mixing uh, beer and, and and spirits. You know, and that that uh, was it. Uh, beer before liquor, never been sicker. Yep. Um, you know, there's all these little things, and I, I think those took time. You know, I mean, listen, look at the the runway that alcohol had versus cannabis. You know, because cannabis has been so you know widely regulated and restricted. Like we're at the the starting point here. And, you know, maybe in a few generations from now, you know, education around edibles, it's not going to be the bud tender's responsibility. It's going to be, you know, just It'll like... It'll be in probably schools ex- or commercials. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Government yeah. agencies will be, you know, public service yeah. announcements around this. And yeah. I think that's that's the right way to go. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, take the learnings and, and properly, you know, implement and, and uh, encode them and, and make sure they're they're being delivered by the right people and, and to the right people. Yeah. I think you should come up with a rhyme. Yeah. I'll work on that yeah. uh, after a few beers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some 1906. Yeah, that, yeah. That'll spark the genius. There you go. <laughs> I think it's I think it's very interesting because I think that's one of the things that this industry and and every industry um kind of kind of needs because in a lot of marketing, and I'd love to talk to, to get both of your opinions on this, because uh, obviously, Patrick, with marketing, obviously, all of the research that and you've done with 1906 and everything that you've done before, I want to get to your background also here in a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, but I think it's kind of poignant to talk about this right now, which is, you know, I there there are a lot of brands that go just for like celebrity value, um, you know, this kind of chic, very high end uh, type of thing where they don't have these these core values and these things that they stand behind. And, you know, I think even in today's culture with social media and things like that, I think that only goes so far. Um, I think people are looking for brands who speak to them, who are, you know, pardon the way I say it, but, but by the people, for the people, that sort of thing. And I think a larger segment, and I could be completely wrong here, I've, I'm have i basing this off of just what I'm thinking. You're a consumer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, and based on my habits, um, are I tend to go with products and with companies that I that I trust that have some value um, that have core beliefs and values and that make consistent reliable quality products they don't necessarily need to have uh, a celebrity spokesperson snapchatting this and you know this that and the other for me to get it um, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people look for you are people rely on that sparkle you know but that sparkle only lasts an instant yeah. most of, most of these most of the products that are available it's unfair to call them brands. They are products with a logo. Um, a brand is a promise. Like the clinic is a brand because it's a promise of the highest quality that you can get. It's a promise of uh, the service that, that you expect. Um, but most other things there, it, there is no promise there. So there is no relationship. You don't know what is this brand giving me. It may be a different flavor. It may be just a new logo on it, but there isn't really a core ethos to to what it is. And I think we're going to see a lot of these products disappear um, off the market because because they they don't really have a consumer appeal. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, before we get into like the, the brand sort of personification and consumer relevance, I, I'll just take a step back and what I love about Peter's, um, you know, the, the story behind your brand uh, creation, and I saw it in an interview that you did. I watched it on Vimeo today, and I believe that every good or great brand, I should say, or service, branded service, whether it's a product or service, starts with a problem and it ends with a solution. And you talked about your three your three pain points, right? We talked about bad taste, 
no, <clears throat> no clue how it will make you feel, and the long delay of when it takes effect. Those are real problems, and you guys created a solution for it. So if you don't have that, if you don't have that solution for that problem, you don't have a product or a service. And then you get into the branding of it. And that's where, because there's, there's going to be other people that create a brand or a service to, start to address those problems, right? Yeah. But how do you differentiate yourself from those other brands? And that's where the branding comes in. That's where your consumer targeting comes in so that you can, if you know who your audience is, which I know you do based on some of the things you've already said to us, then your messaging is going to be that much more stronger. If you are going to get a celebrity spokesperson, right, if you're going to invest that type of money, that's fine. It can be effective. But don't just do it for the sake of having a celebrity spokesperson. Make sure that celebrity is relevant to your consumer base. Make sure that celebrity is saying the right things about your product and to that audience. So you see so many brands just burning money because they don't have those values. They don't have the problem and the solution in place. And I, and I agree, Peter, I do think the next step for the cannabis industry, because it's starting to get cluttered, what's going to separate the brands is marketing. Um, and, and that's, for me, it's especially exciting, but I think it's exciting for everybody. I think that's where you're really going to start to see, you know, some, some great things out there. I think it's going to elevate the, uh, the product. It's going to elevate the, the experience for the consumer or the shopper. And, uh, you know, if you're in the industry, it's, uh, it's going to be just an incredibly exciting time. Dare you say elevate the culture? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I did that intentionally, but it was just a total Freudian slip there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I think I, I think you're 100 percent correct there. It's it's one of those things where it's just people will get celebrities or do something into flash in the pan. You know, um, it's something that just grabs attention really quickly, doesn't have a lot of merit behind it. And a lot of people do that. Uh, and consumers look, can sniff that out nowadays, especially the millennial consumers. I know they take a lot of a lot of shit, you know, from from marketers and, and, and you know, the older generation. But I'll tell you, in terms of consumer savvy, they're they're the, hot, they're the tops. I mean, think about all the information that they're inundated with and, and they process it. They can sniff bullshit better than any consumer we've ever seen in, in you know, in the last, you know, century. Well, and I th- uh, to that point, I think that's one of the Th- that's things why, that's that- why we don't really go after the millennials. They're too hard. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're focused on, you know, people who are too busy. They don't have time to be on social media all the time. You know, <laughs> no, yeah. But, yeah nah. the millennials are a hard market. They are You're absolutely man. right. But they if they but if they do start talking, it's almost exactly. that word of mouth, oh, you yeah. know, that that you got back in the day, you totally. know, where uh, that was the the number one way people heard of new music and things like that, you know, was word of mouth um, as opposed to magazines and internet and things like that. Um, but now it, I guess they everyone has a voice on the internet, so it's very muddied. Um, so it's and w- talking about going after you know different markets, you know, um, I think it's very very admirable, and I think it's something that looks to the future of what this the cannabis industry is because there are all of these new growth markets, there are new consumers that you know for years had bought into the reefer madness or just thought it was a gateway drug and these sorts of things and over the last decade or so you know we've we've really i think started to change some minds um even my parents really you know uh to to a point that and i think that those are those growth markets um that you know people really need to educate more and more they're seeing it now i think more in the news and the mainstream media that sort of thing which makes them a little more comfortable but it comes down to, you know, uh, the clinic. It comes down to 1906. Um, it comes down to us carrying your product and and other products that we believe in and trust. And you know, you being someone that's that's reliable, has good flavor, has amazing bioavailability. Um, it's it, it kind of hits on on all fronts when we when we're looking at kind of the future of cannabis and where we are right now. But it's only going to keep growing. Um, I, I think it's definitely only going to keep growing. So um, I do want to talk about the flavor aspect really quickly. Yeah. Um, so you, you put a lot of time, you said, into uh, the bioavailability, um, hired a lot of people. And I can tell you when it comes to flavor, I have eaten quite a few edibles that just have this nasty food grade oil taste. Um, it's not there's no flavor to it. If I if I'm going to eat. Uh, a gummy or uh, a cookie or a chocolate or something like that. I expect it to at least have some semblance of of that, of what I'm eating, as opposed to just, you know, hashy flavor. Um, and and there have been a lot of those that, I, that I've tasted over the years. Um, how long did you work on that? And it seems like that's something as a core value you also obviously thought about from, from the very beginning. Yeah. 
flavor is something we're constantly working on and trying to improve. I mean, we're lucky. Our uh, head chocolatier and head of engineering and operations is Aaron Holzer, who spent uh, 12 years running Theo Chocolate, which is one of the largest uh, bean-to-bar chocolate makers in the U.S. And he's had experience creating all different kinds of chocolates and all different kinds of flavors, and he's a master. Um, so Aaron deserves a lot of the credit for developing the flavor profiles. What we wanted to do is to think about, you know, we call our different products experiences. And the way we thought about the experience is that the experience starts even before you have consumed the product. It's how you look at it. It's how you hold it. It's how you smell it. It's in your mouth. And what we wanted to do is ensure that for each experience, uh, the organoleptic element, which is the flavor uh, element of it, match the desired experience as well. So we, so for instance, Go, which is energizing, that has that's a dark chocolate. It has coffee nibs in it. What does that make you do? So first of all, the coffee aroma triggers that sensation of, oh, okay, I usually have an association of coffee when I'm you know, looking for more energy. The fact that it has coffee nibs on it and you chew on it makes your jaw work more. So you're actually exerting energy as well. So we try to consider all those elements in each of our different experiences. And um, Aaron, like I said, he is a master chocolatier, one of the best in the world. And so we blended different single origin blends for each experience in order to deliver that that specific profile and, and effect. And I'll tell you, you know, we still have ways to go. I mean, I'm, I'm generally happy with the flavors, but we're making, you know, more improvements on it. The peanut butter cup, if you haven't had the peanut butter cup, is wow. Yeah, it's absolutely bliss. Yeah. delicious. Yeah, yeah. the bliss, bliss is great. Yeah. The bliss is and the work that Aaron and the team did on just making the peanut butter that was three months of work sourcing the peanuts from the right place, roasting it to a particular roast curve, and then also a particular level of creaminess and crunchiness we desired. And then we we take the peanut butter, then we add sea salt, we add mesquite flour, we add ghee to give it a nice kind of smoothness. So we work, we're flavor snobs, uh, and we work on flavor all the time. Um, because we started off with the idea like this is cannabis it's about getting high it's about pleasure and you shouldn't have to compromise you shouldn't ha- it doesn't have to feel like medicine it doesn't have to taste like medicine you should be able to have it all um and that 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 was our view which is why we focus so much on flavor yeah it's a great point about the 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 importance of the ingredients um cuz you know when i got here and i started to to sample some of the edibles and you know, you'd look at the packaging and you'd read what's inside and it does not mirror what's happening on the, the shelves in your grocery stores. You know, there's obviously a lot of people who are out, in, <clears throat> out there trying to eat cleaner, uh, looking for real food and real ingredients. And, you know, because inedible is, you know, I think a little bit different in the sense that you're buying it for, you know, the high, obviously, um, that maybe people aren't reading the rest of the ingredients and there's a lot of shit in there and yeah. like bad yeah. stuff, you know, whether it's the sugar game, whether it's the dairy game, whether it's just, you know, synthetically produced uh, ingredients. Uh, there's some funky stuff in there. And, uh, you know, uh, you're, when I remember reading your labels, I was like, all right, these guys are using a lot of the, the real stuff. Yeah, we, 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 everything is all natural that we put in there. Um, and you know this better, Pat. I mean, people, beer is not, you don't drink beer to get drunk, right? You, beer, you drink beer to enjoy. And if that's the consequence of it, okay, because you want to feel a little buzzed, great. But for most people, they want to enjoy what their beer tastes like. And what, what I always found interest, what I always still find interesting in the cannabis market, is how little differentiation there is in terms of price. Um, there's a real reversion to the median in terms of, especially in the edibles, about most things clustered around a particular kind of price point. There, if you look at alcohol, beer, you know, you name it, the variance in price is enormous. I could spend three dollars on a bottle of wine. I could spend three thousand dollars or even more on a bottle of wine. And people get to choose what it is that they want based upon their income level, based upon their what it is that they're looking for. And similarly, I think we need to get more differentiation even in the cannabis space uh, to give people those those different choices there. It's not just a delivery vehicle for 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 cannabis. 
It is food. And as food, there you, go. you should yeah. think about it in that way. Yep. I'm putting this into my body. How should it react in my mouth? How should it react in my body? What is the health consequences of you know high, you know palm oil or other things like that that you find? Some of these chocolates aren't even chocolate, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, I'm on my soapbox. No, no, we, I, <laughs> I, I like up. that. I'll Keep get up on. there yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm glad. No, I you know like I said just the shock of seeing some of the stuff that was in there and just again like you know you walk into a natural grocers or a sprouts even you know even some of the like a king supers like you know you look on the messaging and and you know it's very ingredient focused you know people looking for organic gluten free all those things that are out there and you know a lot of people don't even know what that actually means but they're looking for it you know and yeah. uh um, it's it's nice to see that there's an evolution, you know, happening or starting, I should say, here in the cannabis space. And if you guys are at the forefront of that, I think that's well, fantastic. I, I think you guys are just as well. You know, you're creating an, an experience for customers in the store that attracts the right kind of customer. I remember when I started in early 2015 and how many times I heard from people, it's all stoners. They don't care. They just want the biggest bang for the buck. It doesn't really matter. And I was like, that's bullshit because... These are the same people that will, you know, for some that may be the case, right? There's always a population that are really price sensitive and may, you know, may be drinking ever clear if they're not consuming cannabis, but that's a small portion of the population. Most of us care about what we drink. We don't just drink coffee from 7-Eleven. We go to Starbucks. We don't just drink, you know, uh, uh, tap water uh, out of the out of the waterfront. We'll buy a nice bottle of Volvic or Fiji water, right? So why should cannabis be any different? And I and one of the things that we're happy about is that we hope we're making strides in proving those naysayers wrong. That people do care. That they will pay for quality. And and we respect our consumers. We want to give them the best. Well, and also when it comes down to, there are a couple notes on experience as opposed to feeling. And I, and I love that you use experience. Um, I, and I know if Ryan were here, he would absolutely love that too. He does not like uh, when people sell feelings. Um, and I love experience. Ryan gets on a very high soapbox when it comes to that. Um, you know, I'm not but, trying to make you feel asleep. I'm trying to make you sleep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> see, you, see, you just nailed it. You just nailed that it. That is another solution. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm putting you to bed. Yeah. yeah. I, and, that, and that's why I, I chose this and that's why I consumed it. Um, so, I, so I love the way that you, you use that and I love the way 1906 is an experience. Um, like you said, from even from the moment you think about going to the store and what you're going to get you you know if i think i'm going i'm going to get some edibles i'm going to go get some 1906 right um but those ingredients are all part of the experience and you're infusing it with you know like you said um you know co like uh cocoa espresso beans like things like that but throughout all your different experiences you've tailored that and you're using different herbs and different like psychosomatic like ways of, of using that it's almost the way when I think of sour sour diesel and you think of the terpene limonene, you know, you think of uh, lemon and people cleaning their house. It's a very awake experience and, you know, it's fresh and 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 lively. Um, you do that with a, with a lot of the ingredients that you use. How did you end up, you know, choosing all of those uh, ingredients? I know a lot of them um, I've obviously heard of before and people take them as supplements. Um, but how did you kind of, pardon the pun, but like weed out uh, other ingredients <laughs> than, than others? Had to, to get those. those. Yeah. Um, you know, we started with the belief that uh, people have been using cannabis for all different kinds of functions uh, since the beginning of time. Um, some people use it to help them enhance their sex life. Some people use it to help them focus. Some people use it to help them sleep. So cannabis has been used in a wide, wide variety of circumstances um, in people's life. And what we know today from the research is that a lot of that differentiation between how it affects you in one way versus how it affects you in another way is a function of the cannabinoid and the terpenoid uh, uh, composition in flour when you smoke it. The terpenes don't make a difference in edibles. Let's just be clear because terpenes are volatile compounds and the way they get activated is by smoking. They get released into the air. They come into your, in, into your you know, nasal system and that's how they affect you. So if you just ingest a bunch of terpenes, it's not going to give you the, the same effect, which is why we find this uh, 
uh, indica sativa hybrid classification kind of um, a, a complete uh, it's completely duping uh, customers um, when it comes to edibles. And the second thing is that people have been using other types of plant medicine as well to do all these types of things. So the genesis of 1906 also was to give people access to great plant medicines that we've been using pharmaceuticals and relying on pharmaceuticals for years. We have access to compounds in nature like cannabis that potentially could help benefit us as well. And cannabis works really well with a lot of these other compounds. So what did we do? We thought about here are the different experiences that we were trying to deliver to people based upon kind of, you know, consumer needs. And then we looked at, okay, what are the different cannabinoid compositions that uh, lead to that? And what are all the other things that humans have consumed or have access to them from plant medicines that could do that as well? And then we spent a long time literally, you know, you know, weeding through things. So we wanted compounds or other plant medicines that, number one, were safe. We didn't want to have people that had adverse effects. We needed something that could be taken in a small dose and it was effective, that it's not like a vitamin B12, where for most people you have to take it, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple times in order to feel effect. We wanted instant effect. Again, coming back to kind of my impatience. Um, <clears throat> we wanted uh, uh, plant medicines that were... Um, uh, worked on the endocannabinoid system or were somehow synergistic with cannabis as well. Um, and so then we did a lot of testing because while there is there's more research on these other plant medicines than there are on cannabis there because these other plant medicines are not illegal, there is very little research out there that talks about the interaction effects of different plant medicines together. Um, and what, what did that mean? We needed to have tons of uh, uh, focus groups and subjects, people who would try our different compounds to give us uh, feedback and reaction on it. And so we started by making everything in pills. So first we'd make a, a pill, for instance, of Corydalis or of Skeletium, get people's feedback. Then we'd say, okay, let's combine L-theanine and caffeine together. Great. How does that work? Now, now let's add THC and CBD. So it was it was tons and tons and tons of just uh, uh, research and development and, and trial. I we always tried to ground it in science, but in a lot of these things, there isn't the full scientific literature or research available to be able to, uh, you know, to fine tune it as well as we'd like. And then, you know, the last thing is consumer feedback. You know, when we launch a product, we are always constantly asking for feedback from our from our uh, consumers as to how could this be done better and and what's failing or what's not failing, so on and so forth. So. You know, we're, we're, we're tweaking our products. For instance, we just we had our first product, which was for relaxation and anxiety. That was called Pause. Um, and we got feedback that people weren't really feeling the anti-anxiety, the anxiolytic effects as strong as they'd like. And so we uh, uh, quintupled the dosage of CBD. So it went from 5 milligrams of CBD to 25 milligrams of CBD in one serving. And we realized, okay, that's the sweet spot. That works. And it had a dramatic effect on people now in terms of delivering that anti-anxiety, that relaxation, but still being able to focus because it's not about putting you on the couch. It's about still being able to be functional. So I'd say it's a lot of trial and error, and we're always open to more and more feedback about how to fine tune, uh, how to fine tune that. When it comes to Midnight, for instance, which is one of our best-selling products, we're now working with CBN, which is another cannabinoid, and working with Valerian and working with L-theanine. So. We're already refining our midnight product uh, because we never stop. Um, even though it's our number one selling product and it's great, there's always more improvement to do. And so we think that this extra combination of CBN and valerian and L-theanine will even make for an even better night's sleep. That's great. Prior to 1906, did you have a lot of experience with plant-based medicine just on your own? Like, were you a user? Were you a believer? Yeah, uh, you know, I've, I've been a big believer of plant medicine. I got exposed to plant medicines, you know, about two, three years before before I started in 1906. 
I uh, in a really active way, and you know that includes both uh, substances that are that are illegal as well as substances that are legal. Because in addition to cannabis, we have a whole host of other psychoactive substances there that have proven clinical research and have efficacy, whether it be for vets who have PTSD and the benefits that they've had on MDMA for people who are at end of life scenarios and psilocybin mushrooms have been transformative in helping ease their journey, you know, to the next, you know, to, uh, to end of life, um, to all the research that we have from the sixties on, on LSD and some of those benefits there. So I got exposed to, uh, a lot of that in a, I would say not in a recreational, but in a, in a medicinal way, some of those substances there. And that's what turned me on to, you know, you can't listen to the government when it says it's, it's illegal and, it, and, and it's bad, that that means that uh, there is no useful benefit. Yep. Yeah. Also, the government is very good at saying things are legal and okay for you, and they're actually horrible for you. It's actually poison. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. oh, yeah. um, I mean, o- if, if, opioids, yeah. maybe? Yeah. yeah. They, like, they hand you, those if out if like I flyers said, to I a descri- jam band show. Yeah. On the, if I described know? a drug to you called Oxycontin, I said, here's what it does. Yeah. It's one of the most addictive substances. Um, it will make you want to take a stronger and stronger dosage of it. It will kill tens of thousands of people a year. And uh, should this be legal? You know, uh, if cannabis killed five people, if five people died all of a sudden from cannabis, that would be major news, front page headlines. There would be like, oh my God, you know, how are people using this? But the fact that there isn't the same you know, and you can make the argument that some of these substances that are being prescribed by Purdue Pharma, you know, and other things like that, why do we need them? Yeah, no, this is a this is a nasty rabbit hole we could fall down right now. Yeah. I, I agree with you 100. percent It it really is frustrating. You know, there's a lot of hypocrisy out there, and uh, you know, it it does frustrate me when I hear people, even when I've told people, you know, I've moved on to the cannabis industry and and to get, you know, sort of a uh, you know, a negative reaction or a, you know, disgusted, uh, you know, response or, 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 or look, you know, it, it, it doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. But it, there is something to it where I'm just like, come on, have we not, uh, have we not, moved <laughs> have we not moved on? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it, it's just crazy that, that people are so accepting. I mean, we live in a pill culture and, and, and that's the thing. People want to just pop the pill. I mean, you know, I use rabbit hole. We got another Alice in Wonderland reference here is, you know, it's drink me. It's, you know, the elixir, it's snake oil. It's, it's all that stuff. And, and, and I understand it. I, I really do. You know, I'm an American and, uh, I get it. Um, but it is frustrating that, uh, that some of the legislation and, and, and things along those lines is, you know, has, has put us where we are today. Uh, yeah. Because I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are, uh, hurting out there because of it. I, I think so too. I th- but I think, you know, the cannabis industry has obviously made amazing strides, yeah. um, in, in the past, you know, a couple of decades. Um, but Not then even you, in the past th- five years, can you, if somebody told you five years ago, right, we legalized legal sales in Colorado started January 1, 2014, five years ago. And if somebody said, okay, you're going to have, you know, this many states making it legal. The whole country of Canada is making it legal. Thailand uh, just said that, that it's going to be legal yeah. medically. Like, we would never be able to predict that. I think the cannabis uh, wave is, is is like what we saw with gay marriage. Within a period of a decade or so, uh, it was transformed kind of the social and political attitudes around this. Yeah, that's a yeah. great, that's a great uh, comparison there. Yeah, it's like a... The dominoes are, are really starting to, to fall, aren't they? Yeah. I, and I think it's opening up at least a little bit more when you talk about these other substances. Um, you know, organizations like MAPS, um, you know, studying MDMA. Um, I think they're in their third clinical study for either that phase or three. Si- phase three for, is it is it MDMA or is it psilocybin? MDMA. And then psilocybin, I think, is in phase two. Yep. Um, so they got funded for that. But Isn't there a, a bill coming up pretty There's a uh, referendum in Denver to yeah. decriminalize psilocybin. Here. Yeah, that was in the post uh, this yeah, weekend. Yeah, and, and it's a, it's very interesting that that referendum. It's not just for people to be taking it and walking around, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's to make it's it so that it doesn't it. ruin families and yeah. and and these things, which I think is very important because it's something that people will look at again and and from a mainstream view and and have a bad viewpoint. Um, again, you can you could say. Almost, uh, almost like edibles, smoking too much, taking a dab, and it being your first time having that one instance, and then 
you know, all of a sudden condemning it forever. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things where uh, education, uh, research, testing, studies, all of those things come into play. Um, and, and even with uh, botanicals, plant medicine and, and herbs, like you're talking about, um, a lot of those things, you know, they w- they all still say, uh, you know, that they don't do this. You know, they can't, you know, say that it 100% does this. Um, but for thousands of years, humans have been taking them, which I think is one of those things that really leans back to cannabis. It leans back to what you're putting in the product and what people believe in. It's not something that just popped up out of nowhere. It's something that is historically within the human genome that people have believed in and had in their cultures for thousands of years. Yeah, even more. I mean, we we don't understand the endocannabinoid system. Like, why is it we have this endocannabinoid system for which THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids really work within our body, right? Um, so there is something there that we still don't have a good understanding about that uh, relates to how we were created or how we function and the affinity with cannabinoids. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. Um, Patrick asked a few minutes ago, you know, about your your background with, you know, uh, plant sciences, plant, plant medicine, um, holistics, that type of thing coming into the cannabis industry. Do you mind giving us a, a background? Because you actually have a, a very interesting, very successful background uh, where you came from uh, before uh, coming into the cannabis industry. Yeah, I mean, you know, sort of like a random walk of life. I, I started after undergraduate. I went to go do my PhD in political science because I wanted to be an academic and realized, you know, that wasn't the path that I wanted to go down. And somehow I managed to, uh, not knowing what I wanted to do next, I got a job in management consulting at the time and worked in finance then. And I worked, I spent 20 years in a variety of different uh, finance roles. Uh, and it was something I, I would say I enjoyed, I was good at it, but I also knew that that wasn't where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. I'm, 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 as I think about it now, I'm even shocked that I spent 20 years <laughs> doing that. And uh, one day uh, came back from a horseback riding trip in Botswana where I was out with uh, my wife in the bush, like totally disconnected from Does from not anyone. sound horrible. No, that was amazing. <laughs> and, you know, riding horses among zebras and giraffes and elephants. And I came back um, and on the first day I came back, like the world was so magical and big down in Botswana that I came back and said, I, I can't be doing this anymore. So I quit the next day. And said, I had no idea what I was going to do next, but I knew I didn't want to. You really, you, the very next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pulled like a Jerry Maguire. Kind yeah, of exactly. Of, uh, like, okay. <laughs> who's I'm coming done. with. Yeah. 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 I just felt, you know. Uh, That's awesome. There was, uh, I didn't, when you're in finance, your 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 life really is around uh, making rich people richer. <laughs> That's what you do. Well and said. I just realized like, yeah. that is no longer what I want to do with my life. Good for you. Yeah. We're well, glad to have you well, well, for a number of reasons. Yeah. And well, I'm and much poorer now. So. <laughs> but happier. But yeah, happier. But you can't yeah. put but a happier, price on yeah, it. More, more fulfilled. You can hear it when, you, when you're talking about everything that you've put into it yeah. and, and all the people that you hired. I mean, even talking the way you spoke about Aaron, your chocolatier, which that sounds like the most amazing job ever being a chocolatier. I mean, uh, I, I maybe don't need to go to Botswana to maybe quit tomorrow and try and be a chocolatier. Um, but uh, no, I'm not going to quit tomorrow. Um, but uh, but it's very interesting that you can you can come from that and then and then move in with uh, with such a passion um, and, and such a reputable product and uh, such backing that you, you know, um, want to keep pushing it this way. And you've talked about some of the, the other products that you have coming coming online. You've talked about the drinks. Um, is that something that's coming soon? Is yeah. That- I mean, so the, the way we look at it is it starts with the question of how is it you want to feel? That's the, you know, and what experience do you want? And then how is it you want to consume? So we started with chocolates because we love chocolate and we wanted to show people that you can do it right. And chocolate is a universally loved flavor. Um, but as we look at our product lineup, it can really consist of four, uh, four product categories. Chocolate is one. Um, and we're going to continue to make innovations in chocolate and flavor. We're coming out with a, uh, a chocolate-covered blueberry and chocolate-covered ginger. So we're going to have some fun stuff in the, in the chocolate realm. 
Um, pills, because we're a pill popping culture. <laughs> so we have, we call them drops Yay. because they're shaped like a teardrop. And so those will be coming out um, beginning of May. And that'll be each of our five experiences. Plus, we're launching a sixth experience because one of the things that uh, some people want to use cannabis for and, and what some people use other substances for is for cognitive focus. Um, and so we have a new product coming out, which is called Genius, um, that we're really <laughs> excited about um, uh, because you can fix stupid. <laughs> is that, I hope that's the tagline. Uh, <laughs> I can make so many poor jokes right now. I, I need to stay away from this one. Um, oh, boy. Uh, so, we have, so we have our pills and then we have beverages coming out. Beverages will be launching in the summer and those, those will be really nice low dose uh, beverages available in different experiences. And then uh, vapes, um, and vapes will come last because we already have the you know the market is saturated with vapes right now that people are doing well. We have a, a little bit of a different spin on a on a vape line. We still got a lot more work to do on that, so you know that could be that could be m- maybe another year before we launch that. And so we look, you know, our view is we won't launch a product unless we know unless it's good enough for my mom. If my mom, you know, uh, doesn't, if my mom can't take it or if I don't feel comfortable giving it to my mom or, or other people like that, then uh, then it, it doesn't hit the market. So that's kind of our, our, our target market. So hope, hopefully vapes sometime this year, but that could be pushed off. Yeah, that's a great gold standard to have, though. Um, it, it really is. Uh, we had Al Harrington on last month, and, and he said that uh, if, it, if Viola couldn't take it, then... Viola wouldn't put it out, you know, um, and and you two are the only two we've had on to, to say something like that, and that is an amazing gold standard because uh, I wouldn't put something out that my mom wouldn't touch either. Yeah, it's impressive. Like in the industry thus far, I've learned how influential moms have been <laughs> on, on cannabis users and 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 now products and brands. You know, it's it's really cool. I mean, mom, so, you know, they're the mom fastest knows best. I mean, segment. How, Seniors are the uh, fastest yeah. growing segment of consumers. How yeah. is that not a yeah. ringing endorsement for you know? Right. My mom never recommended alcohol to me. Now it's you know she's does, recommending. Does your cannabis. mom use? Does your mom use? <laughs> My mom now uses. So uh, there you go. <laughs> well, a, one, he, one one consumer at a time, Patrick. Yeah, she <laughs> she was uh, she was one of the ones that was disgusted when I told her I I got a job in the cannabis industry. Yeah, she grew up. Uh, She's Irish Catholic, very conservative, and 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 you know all that. And uh, she was a little bit disappointed when I told her, and I said, oh, you know, sorry, mom, and you know we'll figure this out. And then she happened to be coming out to Denver just a week later. It was just uh, by by coincidence. And I, before she came out, you know, I sent the the, the website link to her. I said, this is the company I'm working for. There's great people and great products. And if you're interested, you know, read more. And <laughs> she came out with my aunt, her sister, and and they landed in the airport. And the first thing she says to me is. I want to try some edibles. And I'm like, what the fuck happened over the last couple of days? Like, you know, just a couple of days ago you were disgusted and now you're like, I want to try edibles. So yeah, she read up and I think she realized that all oh, she, she probably learned that most of her friends were, you know, interested or either using them as well. And um, yeah, we, 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 tri- we did some microdosing out here and um, you know, taught her some of the fundamentals. And I think she, she had a very different perspective, you know, just within a week's time. And uh you know, I, I think within the peer group, I think that's the big thing is that I said to her, I'm like, start to ask some of your friends how they feel about, you know, cannabis. And you might find out that, um, you know, they're not as maybe conservative as you are, as as, as they say. So, yeah, things yeah. things change. My mom does not consume um, just just because of her job. Um, she's an educator. She's a department head, foreign language department head at a private school in Atlanta. Um, so so she can't. Um, but she does say so she was diagnosed in 2004 with a child's form of leukemia and she was diagnosed with a child's form of leukemia that only 15 percent of people over the age of 26 uh, ever get diagnosed with Um, and it was a form of leukemia that one of my youngest sisters I have two younger sisters one of my younger sisters her best friend had passed away six months prior to that same form of leukemia when she was a child so really hit home was tough my mom had 92 percent uh white blood cells were cancerous and leukemic um and i she now says she wishes that she had had access and openness to cannabis and cbd and things like that and all and at least you know we talk 
now, uh, even earlier, about how much education there is still needed. But even now, she feels very comfortable with the the education that she is getting. Um, and luckily, you know, my my mom went into remission, which is amazing. So, which is why she's still with us today. Um, but she started becoming a proponent back then. And as the industry's grown, and as I've grown with the industry over a decade, um, you know, very very supportive. But to your point, Patrick, she talks to her friends and, yeah. <laughs> and her friends say, I can Zoom. And, you know, um, you know, I, I, I've gone out to Colorado and I've gone out to Washington and Oregon and these places and, and I can Zoom. You know, they have children who live out there. And um, it's very interesting because she lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta, yes, it's a it's a big city and, you know, to an extent progressive, um, but it is also still in the south. Yeah. Um, and, and there is a lot that goes on there. So um, to be able to see that and even even my dad, uh, you know, has has always been fully supportive of it. It's it's very interesting because then they start telling their friends. And then when I come in town, their friends come in, they're like, oh, you got to talk to Matt. And they have a million questions they want to yeah. ask me and <laughs> yeah. all this stuff. Um, but it's very cool to see that older uh, culture for my parents' culture, you know, interested in it and actively researching and asking questions and going and looking at the articles I send them and, and doing their own research. It's very cool. Yeah, I agree. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was something that you had just touched on that I was going to come back to, and then I went down another weird, crazy <laughs> rabbit hole. Oh, now I've got it. Um, so... Uh, we, you know, we've we've touched quite a bit here on alcohol too. You know, talking about that, and when you're talking about your drinks, I have no idea if this is true, but I thought about this when you were talking about it. When people say that, like carbonation, you know, say champagne or something like that, they tend to feel a little more tipsy, you know, a little more quickly. Um, and I think that is because they, and I could be completely wrong here, so please correct me if I am wrong. They say it's because of the carbonation and, and that sort of thing. It gets into your bloodstream just a little bit quicker. Does that tie over to, or do, have you guys done any research into that sort of uh, science when it comes to cannabis? That, that's infused a drinks? great question i hadn't uh i hadn't thought about that but i will we'll do some research and get back to you on that question yeah, yeah I, I i think do you have that, any idea no i've never seen any like any of the studies that i saw I, I know carbonation does it fills you up you know and and when people say you know i can't drink anymore uh especially with beer it's because of that you know it, it's it's that bloated sensation that you have from your stomach i think alcohol is you know no different than cannabis in terms of like everybody has you know the different biochemistry so alcohol affects people differently i mean we've all we've all seen that and in some cases you know it's unfortunate you know the way it affects people um but so i, I imagine that it's true what's happening to them but um you know i i've never seen any research or studies that talk about maybe the effective carbonation in terms of how it metabolizes alcohol faster for certain people yeah, um, I've no, it's it's all hearsay. Like yeah. you said to me, I have never. It's not science. It's I mean, some fact. of the things that we all know are, are true, and and you hear some of the same with edibles. And it's funny when I first heard it, in terms of you know, it's like drinking on a bad, empty stomach is a bad idea. We all learn that, right? And I think it was probably like a month or two out here when we we're talking about edibles one time, and somebody mentioned that it's good to have a natural fat when you you know take an edible because it will help metabolize it better into your bloodstream. And I was like. I knew that. Why wouldn't I have thought of that on my own? You know, it's just you, you, you kind of sometimes you don't connect the dots there. Right. And, and, and also, too, when you're in social situations, you know, you forget these things. It's like we all know that you should probably drink a, a glass of water every other alcoholic drink you have. But when you're in the moment, you're having fun. You're talking to people. Somebody's like, ah, let me get you another round. You don't say, hey, yeah, get me a water, too. I mean, every once in a while you might throw that out. But uh, there's a lot of the same sort of, I think, uh, rituals and, and maybe call them mistakes that, that – that are going to occur in the, in the cannabis the same way they do in the alcohol space. Definitely. Um, so there is a, there is one more thing that I, that I kind of wanted to touch on here, you know, uh, before, before we get out and it's when it comes to, uh, edibles, um, and seeing so many of them in the industry and the way that you've been able to bring 1906 and establish your brand, establish your products. Um, is there anything that you wish that got translated over to the consumer the same way Patrick is saying, you know, we all have these little rituals, we have these things that we've learned over the years, don't eat it on an empty stomach, that sort of thing. Is there 
one or two things that pops out of your mind that you wish got to the consumer uh, more frequently? We've talked about education and, and the, the hugely important fact that bud tenders play um, in this industry. Um, right now, is there something that you think when it comes to edibles that people are not uh, being told or under understanding um, or, you know, kind of a lack of communication that you wish people knew? Yeah, I, I think we need more low dose products. You, you walk into a dispensary and as we all know, the maximum dosage per serving is 10 milligrams. Can't tell you the number of times that I've heard bud tenders say bite half. That is the wrong advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think people, you know, 10 milligrams is not the right answer for actually most people. Most of the population that is that is too much for them. And I think if we had lower dosages, just like in alcohol, we have lower dosages, right? Beer is a much lower dosage than scotch or gin. And we need to see that variety so that people can figure out, hey, what what works for me? And maybe just a little bit, maybe a milligram, maybe two, maybe three or whatever it is, is the right amount for me. Um, because I think the more we do that, number one, the less likely that people will have a bad experience. But secondly, the more people will use it. Yeah. You know, as an industry, we want more. I mean, you know, we're not trying to get people addicted or hooked or anything else like that. But m- more consumption means, you know, better experiences means more money for us. And uh, I always find it bizarre how we, uh, how the industry has yet to catch on to that. And the biggest segment of the market are the people who don't use. So how are we going to get people who don't consume for whom this might be the right answer to consume? And one way is make it simple, make it easy, make it, you know, as much as possible riskless. And one way to do that is through lower and lower dosages. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And a, and a little bit of a segue to I just wanted to, to touch on one thing that um, you guys had uh, conducted a, a consumer research study. Um, so when I first started on the job, it was one of the first things that I was handed was the study that you guys had did. And uh, it was great because, you know, being new to the industry, just having some sort of uh, semblance of, of what are some of the, you know, the, the uh, attitudes in, in the marketplace with consumers and you guys had it broken out by age, gender, et cetera. And, you know, it talked a lot about that, you know, the, the, maybe the, the, the barriers of, of walking into a dispensary and, and feeling uncomfortable and unfamiliar and, and all of that. So I wanted to ask you really kind of like a two-part question is, one, why did you guys feel the need to, to do that study? And then two, and most importantly, is, is what, what have you guys maybe done with the results of that study to, to adapt or, or I should say maybe to, to implement into your, your business? Yeah. We did that study because I reached a level of frustration with uh, the dispensary experience um, and hearing from so many people how they don't want to go to a dispensary, particularly women, uh, how they don't want to go to a dispensary, they don't like the experience of a, of a dispensary, how many times I've walked into dispensaries and found you know most of the butt tenders stoned out of their mind and it's like you don't walk into a wine shop and have the you know have folks a wine drunk. drunk yeah, wine. exactly. Yeah. It's like how is it acceptable in our industry that you walk in and somebody is high on the job? That is totally unacceptable. Um, and so we had a theory, which is okay, that there are barriers uh, that consumers have about why they're they're not going into a dispensary, and we also had a had a theory that um, what because we were being told by industry leaders and store managers that, oh, you know, our consumers are price conscious. Our consumers want biggest bang for the buck. And, uh, and so we went out and did the most extensive consumer research that had ever been done on uh, Colorado and California consumers on their dispensary experience. And we learned a lot of really interesting things. We learned one is that 60 plus percent of consumers want edibles. Number two, that when you ask them what it is that they want to use cannabis for, the fourth or fifth reason is about getting high. Yeah. Right? It was. It was way down the list. It really... Yeah. yeah. But I bet you if you ask bud tenders or if you ask store managers, if you ask other people, why do people walk into the dispensary? They'll tell you, oh, it's to get high. Yeah. And it's like, nope, that's not what consumers tell you. Therein lies the problem. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the other things that we did is, because this research is only helpful, is if it changes perceptions among the industry. So we held 
a industry night where we invited kind of the top leaders ac across the cannabis industry in Colorado, and we shared all these results. So, you know, we paid for the research, um, but we made the research freely available to everybody. And it's like, it's not about competing because we don't see the other people in the room as competitors. We're all trying to grow an industry. And we wanted to encourage a dialogue. And what better way to encourage a dialogue but over facts and also over, you know, some wine, champagne and good food. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, we weren't allowed to serve edibles because of, uh, well, that's a whole other, uh, <laughs> that's a whole other issue. But that would have been very nice. And so that's why. And we, you know, I came from an industry in financial services where there was a lot more data and information, just like, you know, you were talking, Patrick, earlier, but you have, you know, a lot more in the alcohol industry about people's preferences, choices, so on and so forth. But it feels like we're in the dark ages when it comes to understanding our, our consumers. Um so we plan to do one to two more large-scale studies like that a year. Um, not necessarily on, on the same topic for sure, but about consumer attitudes and behavior and share that with the industry so we can all be smarter. That's great. Yeah, no, it was, for me, it was, um, you know, uh, like taking off the blindfold a little bit. And I won't say, if, if maybe it's just one eye, like an eye patch kind of thing, you know. <laughs> There's still a lot of still a lot of uh, unknowns and gray area, but it, it was really helpful to understand what are some of the, the key, you know, issues and barriers um, out there. So, listen, I give you guys a lot of credit for taking the initiative. I mean, it's an investment, right? And, you know, as a small business, um, you know, it's not like you're sitting on coffers. You know, you, you got to be particular and, and, you know, discriminate about where you spend your money. And I love what you said, too, about, uh, you know, helping the industry. You know, it's uh, rising tides, raise all ships, right? So fantastic for you to, to, to do that and, and share it with, you know, people like us. And, uh, yeah, no, thank you for that and um, appreciate it. Uh, it's the only way it's helpful. Yeah, it's it's very helpful. I mean, it, it also goes into with your study and saying that, uh, people, especially women, don't want to go into dispensaries. And you're talking about the large percentage, which is the untapped market. You know, um, there is a, a bill that was introduced about delivery, um, and there's delivery in other states, but there's the possibility of delivery coming on in Colorado. Um, I think in today's culture, today's day and age, uh, a lot of us are, are very familiar. People order their groceries from their phone. People order, um, you know, drizzly. Uh, yeah, drizzly. Yeah, you order alcohol. I order things from Amazon all the time. Just every day I have things showing <laughs> one up. One click. Yeah, one <laughs> click. It's, 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 you know. It's dangerous. It's dangerous, but it's fun. And, and if you live in a market where it's not legal, how do you get your weed now? Exactly. So people are used to actually having weed delivered. Yeah, HBO so, created a yeah a, a, high maintenance. A, 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 I love that show. high maintenance. I mean, yep. and and you know, both of us lived in New York. It's a hundred percent accurate. You know, some of these guys are biking up and dropping off weed. In your you even apartment. saw it in half baked. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, and they show up with like a huge selection. Yeah, like, it's funny to see. Well, it's not funny, but it's, it's <laughs> fascinating to see also over the last ten years how even the illegal market evolved. Right. First, it was just all flour. Yeah, all you know? flour. Yeah, and then now we got vapes. vapes now we got edibles, edibles. Now we have lip balm. We have all this stuff in the in the illegal market. It's like wow, you know, it's amazing. So we need delivery. Yeah. yeah. So how do you how do you see that uh, in the best way? happening because there's obviously going to be a lot of red tape there's going to be we all know how uh how bureaucracy works and you know they're gonna they're gonna make some right moves they're gonna make some wrong moves it's gonna take time to overturn those wrong moves um how, how do you all think that the best way to have that happen is i mean i think we've already established a good way when you said drizzly you know looking at that um you're obviously vetting people's age that sort of thing uh which you would obviously have to do for cannabis um are there it, other major not that hard. That's the first thing we have to realize. Alcohol is reserved for 21 years and older, and people have been delivering alcohol. Cannabis is a product that's reserved for 21 years and older, and we can deliver it. In fact, I would say from a perspective of law enforcement and uh, the risk of diversion, it's much more safer and you have much more transparency for delivery. If I walk into a shop, yeah, I give them my ID, but they don't keep that ID. They don't know how much I actually bought. They just check my ID to make sure I'm 21 and, and I walk out the door. If I have a delivery, they know, okay, I bought this. It came to this address. If I try and skirt the laws and order from 10 different delivery places, for instance, it's known. You have data. Breadcrumbs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I actually think that delivery in a lot of ways is much, much safer 
than uh, uh, than even walking into a store, and then and then also for people who are sick, people who, for whom this yeah, is medicine, yeah. homebound, you yeah. know, homebound. Like, why should they be forced to walk into a dispensary at a certain time, wait in line, so on and so forth, or send uh, or send a caregiver, you know, someone send who's a, care- a care- exactly. caregiver to them yeah. to, to do that. Yeah. Um, I love that you just said that that the first thing out of your mouth there was it's not that hard. Yeah. And and that's something that you know I wish uh, every lawmaker would hear is it's not that hard. Um it, it's already happening and then for you know all of the the reasons that you just stated I actually am I'm a firm believer in all of those. I think um the traceability they talk about track and trace all the time. It's one of the biggest things in our industry is track and trace. Um and and being able to do that and like you said going to the actual house uh you know or, or dwelling where, where someone is um keeping that on file as opposed to just checking it and, and letting them go yeah credit cards on file too i mean that's yep. how drizzly and uh, mini bar work you know exactly. you gotta have a credit card down and that's that's another piece that they can trace back to you and yeah. 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 Well, I think it's an exciting time um, with the with that happening. I think it will happen here eventually, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, um, because I think it could do big things. I think it could open up to a lot of people who are uh, scared to walk into. And I and well, maybe scared is the wrong word, but put off, uh, turned off by it. And, and I can understand that. But that's why, you know. Um, here at the clinic, we try to, you know, make it a very welcoming, opening environment. Um, we try to only carry brands, you know, that we believe in, that we trust. Um, you, you, know. you guys are the best. Yeah. Uh, well, you, re- you really do. Me and Matthew are the clinic. <laughs> All of you. Uh. <laughs> yeah. The clinic and, and, and you and Matthew and we've got Nicole here. Um, yep. And yeah. Nicole. Definitely. Nicole. Nicole's yeah. the best. The she clinic was one of the that. first dispensaries I ever, it was either the first or the second dispensary that, that I went to when I, when I came to Colorado. And and it was, uh, I remember, you know, it was like, okay, this is the store I want 1906 in. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we, thank we you. appreciate yeah. that. Thank, thank you. you. And, and we are very glad that you're in it. So thank you for continuing to do what you've done with 1906, all the products that you uh, have already put out are continuing to put out, um, you know, everything that's coming down the line, the drops, um, you know, also the drinks, uh, possible vapes here. You know, um, I like that you're actually waiting on that um, and doing all of your research because uh, that is, I mean, vape is the largest market that continue continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, but, but doing it right and doing something different, doing something proper, I think is, is very exciting. So I can't wait to see what you guys do. Um, Peter, is there, uh, there are certain sites and uh, social media or anything that you want to plug? Uh, we'll also put it up when we put up this podcast. We'll put up your website. We'll put up um, any other social media that, that you're on whatsoever. But yeah, We're 1906 New Highs and uh, also check out Bebo, which is our sister brand that we've launched here in, in Colorado just a few months ago. Uh, is beautiful. that um, the the tattoo artist? Yes, yeah. Scott Campbell. Uh, Lake, Lake Bell's yep. uh, husband. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And so that's our brand also here in Colorado. It's, we've got a beautiful gold rose yeah, it's a uh, disposable Beautiful design. Yeah, yeah, beautiful design. And that's his grand, uh, mother or grandma? His that's grandmother. An, yeah. Right? yeah. I knew there was another. Yeah, see, <laughs> maternal, everything goes maternal, back to maternal, maternal figure. Mother, yeah, exactly. Maternal <laughs> figure. Yeah. yeah. So check out Bebo. Check out 1906. Cool. Definitely. Well, uh, before we, we get out of here 100%, there is a segment that we always do at the end here. Uh, it's called What You Token About. And we go around the table and uh, we talk about what we're token about. Uh, most recently, it could be today, it could be this week, it could be this month, this year. Um, kind of uh, your most recent, uh, latest and greatest. And it can be in any category whatsoever. So, um I don't know if I want to put you on the spot right off the bat. I can, I can but yeah. Yeah, all right, let's go. Let's start with you, Peter. Um, so I love sparkling water. I mean, I drink water a lot, but I particularly love sparkling water. And was like many, you know, drinking La Croix or La Croix, as they uh. call it here in America. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I came across this brand at Whole Foods uh, maybe six months ago called Waterloo. And I was blown away. Waterloo is a sparkling water that has the best flavors I have ever had from uh, they've got a watermelon flavor they have a mango flavor a lemon lime just this aroma when you open it up it's really nice carbonate it's got the right level of carbonation and then the nose on it is phenomenal so if you like sparkling water you want to have fun really really good flavors and it tastes all natural check out Waterloo 
Waterloo. Nice. I love it. Yeah, I'm gonna. I've I'm never, gonna, I'm I've gonna never check heard it out. Of it. I've never heard of it my, either, but I am I'm, now gonna check it out. Yeah, I love my uh, sparkling waters and club sodas. Anything carbonated is for me is my friend. So that's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Patrick? I got this is this is funny. I, I did not think I'd be talking about this, but I recently discovered and I think here in Colorado I might be laughed at for saying this, but I discovered nutritional yeast. Mm. Anybody yeah, at my, yeah, you guys yeah. otherwise uh, it's also known as nooch. I our, I didn't know our, the nickname or hippie but dust. I've I didn't learned. know that. Either. Yeah, pretty funny <laughs> stuff, huh? I worked yeah. in a health food and smoothie shop like when I was uh, 15 years old. I helped the system <laughs> manage like know. three of them. So yeah, I, I knew but I never called it nooch or hippie dust. Yeah, I, so I read this online. Um so my wife and I we eat pretty healthy and and I'd say we're not like dairy free but we're low dairy. So we learned, um, I've been making popcorn at home, got one of those whirly popper things, and uh, you you can use it as a cheese substitute. So it's got like a bit of a cheesy flavor to it, but it's like jacked up with like B12. It's like it's like really good for you. And uh, there's a, a company that's been around for years called Bragg. They do amino acids yeah. and yeah, fantastic Apple company. Apple cider vinegar. Yeah, their ACV yeah. is awesome. Yeah, yep. so they do a nutritional yeast. And uh, yeah, so I, I bought some of this stuff and um, sprinkle it on uh, our popcorn and figure it out. I could start sprinkling this stuff on everything. So it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of like, it on popcorn oh, now. it's fantastic. It's like, I've been on a popcorn kick recently. It, it's so. like having like a, a, a pocket full of like Cheeto dust or something like that, but it's actually kind of good for you. So um, I highly recommend the hippie dust. Yeah, some hippie dust. <laughs> Get on it. All right. I, I'm going to try that. Yeah. 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 I'm going to try both of I those, Waterloo and yeah. Hippie Dust. <laughs> um, well, uh, when it comes to intake, I'm, I'm pretty boring. I do a lot of meal prep on Sunday nights and just like eat the same thing throughout the week. So then when I actually go out, I can just eat whatever I want. So uh, I am boring when it comes to that. Um, I will say it's going to it's gonna sound that I'm uh, sound like I'm just throwing this out there because uh, you're here on the podcast. But um, over the weekend, I did do uh you know nicole and patrick and i did sit down and have a conversation and i said well i actually needed to go over to the clinic colorado anyway um pick up a couple of things and i said you know uh this one patrick and i started talking about our sleep and so i was like i'm gonna pick up some of the midnight and and give it a shot here i I, you know hadn't given a shot in a little while um but i wanted something that wasn't gonna give me a, a lot of things i I usually give it like 12 hours till I feel it completely out of my system, but it's like this morning after kind of like weed hangover type of thing, uh, you know, and even though I know my dosage, uh, and, and dosing correctly, still, I know it's, I'll wake up at just a little foggy and, you know, an hour, a couple hours later, I feel, I feel normal. Um, but going in with the intent of, of really focusing, um, on the dosage and what I was taking and, and really, you know, uh, going with the effects. And so three nights in a row, actually. So, um, Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night. So it wasn't just a one-off and, and make my decision. Um, and I can definitely, say that midnight is something that I will continue uh, continue to be taking uh, it's uh, it, it's delicious too that's the, that's the thing and it kind of hits you right there like especially in the evenings you know I, I get this little bit of a sweet tooth where you know I just need something and usually I'll eat a little bit of chocolate you know we you know around the house we've got little bowls of chocolate and things like that out um, I'm not I'm not reaching for that. I, you know, I'll take the midnight and uh, and have a good night's sleep. And I can tell you this and I I want to say I, I don't have any scientific evidence on this, but I want to say with the bioavailability that you have and the onset time, um, I'm not waking up groggy. Uh, from it so you know that's and and that's and that's a true statement true testimonial not just saying it uh, because you're here yeah I, I got sort of caught up in your Waterloo recommendation so I went nutritional yeast with mine but yeah I wanted to give a little product review on the midnight as well and I, I agree with a lot of what Matthew said I from a taste standpoint you know I'll say thank you Aaron um, it is it's tasty chocolate it's not uh, and I actually like the taste of, of cannabis I do I, I do like uh, grass flavored uh you know things i can i can handle that taste um but no that that's a that's a tasty piece of chocolate uh so if you don't like the taste of cannabis like this is the chocolate for you that's something i wrote down in my notes uh, i took it saturday and sunday so same as you i wanted to have two different uh because sunday night is my worst night of sleep it's you know it's the sunday scary sunday blues whatever you want to call it um so i think last night was a little bit um it wasn't as good as saturday but it, I took it in conjunction with melatonin, which I, I take a lot of melatonin. Um, and 
to Matthew's point about the grogginess, I was very impressed. I thought I was going to wake up feeling a little bit, you know, heavy. And uh, no, I, I, I had a lot of energy and, uh, you know, it, it was uh, a, a really uh, good experience. I don't know if I could do it every night. I think it's something that like if I feel like because I, I can I can feel if I'm going to have a bad night's sleep. I don't know if, if it's the same for you, but. It's off and on. Sometimes I think I trick myself that I'm going to have a better night's sleep, but most of the time I can feel it. You got to teach me that trick then. (laughs) Yeah, because like I've just, it's kind of like a blessing and a curse. Like my, my, I have a lot of creative, you know, sort of juices going and they tend to come out at night. And it's great because it it especially helps with work, but it also, it's bad because it keeps me up. And, uh, you know, there's times when I feel it, you know, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a night where I'm going to be up late. And, you know, all my tricks, whether it's reading a book, you know, chamomile tea, uh, melatonin, some they're, they're just useless. It's like you know, yeah, uh, you know, some type of kryptonite kind of thing going on. And and I will say, with the midnight, I did it in conjunction with the melatonin. But within twenty thirty minutes, the eyelids got heavy. I, re- I was reading for a little bit, and then next thing you know, I'm you know I'm out. Oh, that's so, yeah, yeah. No, great to hear. Thank yeah. you for that feedback. It was great. It was it was very real. I used the Calm app. Um, and yeah. yeah, I use the Calm app. And so midnight in association with the Calm app. Nice. Um, with the deep sleep release, that 20-minute deep sleep release. Did you go, did you go with the Matthew McConaughey? No, I, no, I don't go. Is there a Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> yeah, I just saw someone on, like, someone on my social I'm, media I feeds. I feel like he's like, it was, all, it was right, a, all right, all right, all yeah. right. It's time to go to sleep. I just feel like I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody in one of my social media feeds, like it was, a, it was definitely a, a woman was like, "Oh my god, I can't wait for this." So. Uh, <laughs> no, I just, I just do the standard voice that comes. Yeah, with it. whatever's uh, available. Yeah, I didn't dig in, <laughs> um, but no, it's, uh, it, 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 it was great. So, so thank you yeah, so yeah, much. Yes, no, thank you. And, uh, and really appreciate you uh, taking the time so out nice of your busy schedule really and, nice and having this conversation. Yeah. I'm sure we could have gone down a million other rabbit holes. So you'll have to come back. So yeah. with pleasure. Definitely. 1906 part two. 1906 part two. So everyone be sure to swing by the clinic locations or any other location that carries 1906 and please check them out. Um, make sure to check out the clinic on any of our social media uh, at Facebook. We are just the clinic search for that and you can get in touch with us on Instagram. It's the underscore clinic underscore Colorado and Colorado is spelt out. It is not an abbreviation uh, and you'll find us on Instagram. And also if you pay attention to the social media, media on there you will find march dabness coming up uh which if you've been with us for recent uh previous years uh, march dabness is something we do in march um with a lot of our concentrates and uh, we're gonna have a lot of sales and specials coming up uh we also have clones coming up the second week of march and uh you know the biggest thing i would say also too is go check out our blog if you haven't because there's a great write-up on 1906 there um what, what? very poignant and it'll uh, pop right in with this podcast so that is the clinicolorado.com backslash blog. I don't think we need to put the www dot in front of that, <laughs> but you're welcome to if you want to. Uh, but make sure you put in the clinicolorado.com backslash blog. Um, so I think that's it. Patrick, thank you so much for uh, sitting in, man. This is an amazing time. This is awesome. I hope I get invited back. You're definitely invited back anytime <laughs> you want to come. Yeah, Peter, you're a fantastic yeah. guest, thank you, man. Peter, thank Great you so, products. so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in and listening. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Leave a review uh, if, you, if you want to. Uh, we hope you do. And until then, keep your culture elevated. <laughs>